Hello everyone, hopefully you can hear me. This is my standard weekly sound and audio check. Uh, if you can't hear this, no, if you can hear this, uh, please let me know in the comments just so I know everything's working. And I will be back with you in, well, about 14 minutes. So I'll, uh, I'll see you then.
And good evening, everyone. Welcome to this week's Live From Ian Studio, edition number 28. And uh, welcome to uh, everyone who's already uh, chatting away in the live chat. Uh, good evening, uh, Raymond. Didn't have the chance to uh, uh, to welcome you on the chat as you uh, you popped up in there. And uh, welcome to everyone else. Uh, so if you are watching this and haven't said hello in the chat, then please do so, so I know you're watching. And uh, great to have you aboard. Um, and uh, have, have you in for the live stream. Right, so let's just move on. Right. Okay, we had a technical glitch there. Um, I got a message on my screen saying that OBS had disconnected and there was various uh, whirring egg timers. So hopefully, from what I can see, we're all reconnected on here. Um, but uh, uh, if, if you can't hear, no. Yeah, uh, well, if it's not working, it's not working, but uh, hopefully you can all hear me now. Right, after that little uh, surprise, let's, um, let's carry on. Uh, for the benefit of anyone who doesn't know, these are weekly uh, shows and uh, I leave them on YouTube for a while, then eventually they get cut down and uh, the full version moves over to my academy uh, with uh, the extracts uh, being on YouTube. And thank you everyone for confirming everything's working again. Uh, okay, hopefully the buffer took care of it, but it just looked a little, it looked very odd on um, my end when uh, my screen got big yellow messages and exclamation marks on it saying it had disconnected. Right, so about the shows, do ask questions in the chat, so the regulars will know that. I have a regular Q&A section. If you're watching on the replay, I know a few of you do watch on the replay, then um, uh, please put your, uh, your questions in there and I will pick them up on a future live stream. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. If uh, you enjoy the show, do subscribe, then you'll get notified when there are future ones and other videos uh, on there. And please comment on the videos, particularly if you're watching this on the replay. I'd love to know um, that you are watching on a replay. Thank you for those who have been doing that. And don't forget to like it. We've got five likes so far and 13 viewers. Come on, the rest of you, hit the like button. Uh, and uh, of course, let people know about the show as well. And uh, hopefully we can uh, extend the, uh, the audience here. Uh, so... Um, yeah, there's a, there is a Facebook group which is tied quite closely in with the uh, the group. The link is over my shoulder on the uh, on the wall behind me. And if you're not a member of that, I advise joining it because the chat carries on there during the week. People posting images. I'm I try to comment during the week. This week's been a bit tricky. I've been away for a couple of days. Well, it was one full day. I travelled a day early and stayed over. And um, I've had the first studio event, which kind of took me away from Facebook this week. Uh, but uh, I will be back on there uh, this coming week and uh, interacting with your posts and your, uh, your images on there. So do share your photos and uh, uh, you can keep an eye on what's coming up uh, on there and what's going on. Have a newsletter uh, on my website to sign up for. And there's the link. It's also down below uh, below the video, as is the link to the Facebook group. So what have we got on the show this week? Uh, well, we've got news, a little one, two, one or two little things I want to share about. Uh, I'm going to just mention the 12020 challenge and how that's going. But we're, our main theme is wildlife photography part two. And either the good news or the bad news, depending on how you want to look at this, there's going to be a part three. So next week will be part three on this. Um, I, as I was going through the preparation for it, I realized I'd got so much on techniques that if I'd have done all of that this week, it would have been a half hour just going through that and wouldn't leave much time for anything else. So I'm splitting it over an extra week. Uh, I did mentioned last week that that might be the case. 
And we're going to look at some of your images, uh, the ones, general ones from the Facebook group this week, and uh, a few um, of your wildlife images as well that you've been sharing. Some nice, nice images this week. Uh, thank you for, for posting. And to everyone else, do keep putting your images in the, in the Facebook group because it gives me something to talk about on a Sunday night. And hopefully it's something that can give you feedback as well. Um, as you know, I, I try to be as constructive as possible with my feedback and uh, hopefully, it, hopefully it'll help you. Um, and we've got the live Q&A. If we get any cues, I will try and provide the A's. I haven't got anything lined up this week on the Q&A. The first thing I want to talk about this evening, it's news, is the events are back. And um, we had the first group shoot at the studio uh, two nights ago on Friday. And I was really pleased with how it went. I'm going to move over into Lightroom now. I want to share with you some of the images of what we did on Friday night. Um, okay, it, it's partly a um, me plugging my events. I'll, I'll let, let me be honest about that. Uh, I know not all of you can, uh, can get over to events here, but some of you can. Uh, so it might be good so you can see the sort of things that we do at the events. But also, it's a chance for me to talk about the lighting setups and a few of the things from my own images, because I don't often actually talk about my images on here. I might show them as examples, but I don't often talk about them. So let me get Lightroom fired up over here. And if I do that, we have Lightroom. So our model on uh, Friday night was Cat Y, um, who uh, uh, was working with us. and. She was at the studio for four hours. Uh, I was experimenting with, because I'm having to keep the groups down to a small number, just three people maximum. And in fact, the way I'm working the events now is I'm finding the photographers first and then um, organizing the event around them. So I got three photographers um, to, wanted to do an event. And between us, I put out the casting call and uh, they, had a look at the models who uh, responded, and eventually Cat uh, Y was chosen. And we decided we were going to do a whole range from a little bit of portraiture and fashion, a fair bit of lingerie, and then very briefly via glamour into art nude. So I'm gonna share with you a few of those images. So let's see what the easiest way to do this is. It's probably not that. Uh, let's try it. Come on, Lightroom, behave. No photo selected. No. Come on. Sorry about this, folks. You wouldn't believe I was a Lightroom expert, would you? There we go. Start at the beginning. So this first shot um, is... Um, a cat sitting on the, the studio steps. And uh, with this, it was pink background and it was lit with uh, basically uh, sandwich lighting. I think I had a light on the background as well. Uh, so we've got light coming in uh, from this side to give us the rim light and light coming in from the front to illuminate her and an extra light just onto the background, uh, which gives the, uh, the natural vignette effect on there. Um, and I'd asked her for a, a, a brightly colored dress uh, for that. So moving on to the next one, again, part of the lingerie set, I brought out the uh, trifold screens. And um, what we did here is we lit the screen from behind uh, so that we could see the silhouette effect uh, through there. Um, the background colour is a gel on there. We did a fair bit with gels actually uh, on, uh, on Friday. Um, a bit of experimentation with them. And actually all these lighting setups are just about ones that I, I think most of them I've done or played with in the past, but they're not ones I'd ever documented. So for me, it enabled me to um, get um, uh, to document them, to get the behind the scenes shots to go with them. 
But moving on, the other trifold screen, this time still illuminated from behind, but no colored gels on it. The pure bright light behind uh, on there. Uh, we've got a front light uh, coming across with just out of shot, we've got a bounce card, um, a bounce, the big bounce board just to fill in slightly on the side there. Uh, in post-production, I've straightened the verticals. As you know, I am, uh, uh, I always make sure that that happens with, uh, with images. So we, we have that. And uh, she's sitting on my chaise short. Well, you can hardly call it a chaise long, can you? Um, and close up, uh, I think um, I'd like to have seen her smiling a little bit more. It, it was, this was partly while I was setting up lights, uh, a bit of a test shot. I didn't really shoot many of this uh, particular close in uh, thing. So uh, I got that. I quite like the, uh, the quirky angle with the background. I think works quite well on there. And then moving on a little bit further, uh, we were working with the gray background. Uh, Yes, it really is a grey background that's illuminated and coloured with uh, with gels. And I used the red gel on there to go with the uh, the red lingerie that she was wearing. Uh, the the key light was very much over to one side, which is why she's looking over her shoulder. And I quite like that look, that gaze away. I think if I'd have had a bit more time. Um, one of the things uh, folks who have attend my uh, workshops will know is I'll try and at the start of each set um, or maybe at the end, I'll grab one or two frames there just so that I've got images I can supply to the models afterwards. Um, but I try to do it very quickly so that I'm, I'm not taking time away from those who are attending. And if I'd have been able to spend a little bit more time on this, I'd have just asked her to adjust the pose slightly so that her face was a little bit more in true profile uh, than we've got on there. But again, we've got the rim light providing light onto the hair and across the shoulder there. Again, I think that works nicely with that. Then we moved on to some sort of classic 1980s glamour um, style. And again, this is the gray background, um, this time with a purple gel on there. And in post-production with this, I've done that skin softening technique that I've, uh, I've shown a couple of times on the live stream, where you take down the, uh, the texture and the clarity overall, and then paint it back, mainly on the hair, the eyes, mouth and fingers, and a little bit on the, uh, the lingerie as well, so that it gives the rest of the skin a really nice, smooth look to it. And then we were doing, we were experimenting with Art Nude using gels. So rather than just a black and white, we were using red gel and blue gel. And I think with hindsight on this set, I think I should probably have had the red and blue the other way around on it. So that the, the red was the narrow lighting and the blue the broad. Um, the, uh, by narrow and broad, uh, narrow is the narrow the side of the face. Broad is if you're illuminating on the, uh, the, the wider side of the face when the head's turned. Uh, so I, I, I think I should have done it that way around. Then again, moving in to some bodyscapes that we did, and my classic howling at the moon shot uh, bodyscape. And I couldn't have a bodyscapes evening without including the Daleks in there, uh, which I'm, I tend to set up quite a lot. Uh, for, for that. So those were what I managed to create during that evening. And for anyone who's interested in the lighting of these two bodyscape ones, uh, what I'm using is a strip light uh, just above um, Kat's body uh, facing straight down, uh, out, but just slightly behind, which gives this rim effect on there. But I held up um, a white card just to bounce back a little bit of light onto the, um, the wolf and onto the Daleks uh, on there. Uh, so that gave that kind of effect uh, for, those, um, uh, for those shots. So heading back over to my slideshow, let me over here, just change back so I can see the comments. 
Right. Um, yeah, uh, I've had a question come in here, which probably not a bad thing. Um, I'll deal with the, your question, Gary. Um, I got the right one. Yeah, that's it. Gary's question at the end there, who who's asking, are there any particular collections of Lightroom presets that I use and can recommend? Um, I'll deal with it in the Q&A because I've got nothing else in the Q&A at the moment. So let's, uh, let's just carry on. The 12020 challenge. It's been, uh, been good to hear that uh, some of you have been doing it. I've seen some of the images already. So well done, folks, on that. I know others have been downloading the, um, uh, the, the, the end sheet on there, the end card. Uh, so for those who may not be aware, let me just give you a quick reminder of what the 12020 challenge is all about. Uh, this is just a very quick overview. If you want the full details, have a look at last week's show or the show before that when I went into full detail when I announced it. So the challenge is that you have two hours, that's the 120 part of it, the 120 minutes, to take just 20 photos. Uh, and here's the catch. It's no deletions, uh, so they have to be consecutive frames. There are no retakes. So every image needs to be a different subject uh, and you must agree to show and share all the images uh, in there. So what the way it's going to work is that after you've got your 20 images, if you send them to me uh, via WeTransfer, then I'll make them into a slideshow which we can, uh, I can show as part of the live stream uh, to see how you go. But, and uh, so well done to those who've, uh, who've taken it on. It's not a competition, but it's a challenge to help you think about your photography. I've already seen people say, oh, that was a bit harder than I anticipated, which is good, which is what I want. Uh, I want you to be challenged by it. Uh, yeah, I just said that, I'm gonna show those. I've extended the deadline by one week simply because I've had, uh, I'm putting in this extra session on the wildlife. So it's now three weeks instead of two. So get your images to me by the 25th of September. And then the following show on the 27th, I will start showing some of these uh, collections. Um, if you want to post some onto the Facebook group before then, I know uh, Andy Grady has. Um, I'll, I might pick up on one or two and include them in the uh, your images section of the live stream, as I'm going to do tonight, Andy. So I've picked up on three of yours that I think uh, I'd like to comment about. So, all right, let's move on to um, Q&A uh, part one. Do add your, quest add your questions into the chat, and thank you, Gary, for yours. Uh, if you are watching this on the, um, the replay, uh, you can either email questions to me and I'll deal with them the following week or put it in the, in the comments. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Gary's... No, 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 go back to that one. Right, uh, Gary's question in chat uh, says, are there any particular collections of Lightroom presets that I use and can recommend? Interesting question. The two parts to it, presets that I use, the ones that I use are all my own, where I have them. Um, and I don't do a huge, I don't have a huge number of them anyway. Um, my work with um, images is contrary to what you might think, I don't do a huge amount with my images, so I don't feel I need a huge number of presets for it. Um, and there is a danger with these preset packs that you can purchase or download, is that you end up with images looking like everybody else's images. So if you are gonna use a preset pack, then use it as a basis for the work or use it as a shortcut or better still do like I do and create your own. Now if you want some that I would recommend the only one that I've used of other people's and I, at these days I don't tend to use them very much is uh, 
Matt Kloskowski. Um, so if you just search for Matt K Lightroom, uh, if you can't, because I can't spell Kloskowski, if anybody does have a link to his uh, his site, I think he's just Matt K or something like that these days, uh, then please put it in the in the chat. I won't have a chance to nip off and uh, and check it during the live stream today. Uh, but uh, his are worth doing. He's um, got some interesting ones. Uh, ones that I use. Let me pop over into Lightroom and I'll uh, I'll, I'll try and show you what I've got. Uh, right. So let's pick an image. Any image. Uh, this one. D. Develop and no. Come on. Fit, not fill Lightroom. Right, okay. So the presets that I've got. Um, ah, I've got a few of the Matt Kluskowski ones in. There's just the two that I tend to use of his are the uh, Lomo ones. Uh, it doesn't work with this particular image. Are there any of those images ones it would work with? I don't know, maybe the Daleks, um, yeah, possibly with that. Um, but yeah, that makes it look like a Lomography one. So I still have those two of his in there. Um, my presets, as you can see, are not a huge number there. I have uh, a couple of split tone ones. My three sisters one is a, a particular image uh, from, a th is a theater set. And I did some work with that. Um, so it's a split toning, but it's actually a little bit more than that because I do some desaturation with it as well. So again, let me find another image that might show it up. This might, it's the wrong color background really, uh, but the Three Sisters effect um, gives it that sort of antique um, look on there. And then there's a sepia tone, split tone one. I'll do that, which works with black and white. So if I go with this one and just apply that, you can see it gives you that um, that sepia tone effect on there. The next, the other three that I use are these, which are all to do with noise noise reduction and sharpening. Uh, it's basically my start point for sharpening and three different levels of noise reduction. Now, none of these should have much noise in them to, uh, to reduce, uh, but I've just got the three levels that I can then step through on noise reduction, and it just saves me a little bit of work uh, on there. Um, so let me just head back to the chat and uh, on here. Ah, yeah. Uh, Andy Grady's found the link. It's mattk.com. So well done. Thanks, Andy. Um, on that. I'm going to, I'll tell you what, what I'm going to do is, are there particular presets that people are looking for in Lightroom that you particularly think will help you with Lightroom. Like for example, that noise reduction set, uh, maybe those split tone ones, because I have thought about making a uh, making my own set uh, of them, uh, because you, you're absolutely right, there are things I do over and over again, and maybe having them as presets more than I actually have, um, as those steps might help people. So if you think there are particular tasks in Lightroom that having a preset would help you with, then let me know either in the comments or in the, the chat or by email. And if I can get, if there's enough to make it worth releasing a pack of them, maybe, uh, maybe you'll have my own set to, uh, to play with. Um, Oh, the other one didn't appear on there, which I have set up in the past. I must have lost it somewhere or filed it somewhere different. Is my um, it's the V word vignettes, different versions of the vignette. Again, just to save a little bit of time on those. Excuse me. Mm. 
my mouth suddenly gone very dry. Sorry about that. Right, so, um, and that's the Q&A for this part. I've got that coming up again later on towards the end. So if you've got any more questions, folks, stick them in the chat and I'll deal with them by the end, at the end of the, uh, of the broadcast, <laughs> the end of the show. Right, feedback session part one. Let's back over into Lightroom again. And I just want to give a little bit of uh, feedback on some of the images that I've seen on the, uh, the Facebook group this week. Uh, right, let me get Lightroom back up here. And bear with me a moment, folks, while I get this right. And yep, here we go. So Lightroom, okay. I've picked up 14 images from different people. I uh, hope um, you're all watching either live or on the replay. So let's start with Andy Grady's. I'll go into develop module tab off there. Now this came from uh, Andy's uh, 12020 challenge. Uh, so uh, I, I picked on this one because I, I like the angle that, uh, that Andy's chosen with it, that quirky angle, those strong diagonals drawing you into the image. And I don't know whether he's done it with a vignette or just with general post-processing to give that really dark, moody sky with it as well. And I think this is image number one of the, um, or very early in the set of uh, the, uh, the 12020 challenge. So it, it tells you where it is. Uh, it's a sort of lead into the garden on their whole garden. So really liked it. Um, Nothing, no criticisms at all on that. I just wanted to highlight it as a really nice 12020 um, challenge image. Again, another one from Andy's uh, challenge, and I quite like this unusual angle uh, looking up on uh, on something. Um, my own, and I like the, the fact that you've gone black and white with it, Andy. The only thing I would have done with this is I'd have made the angle on it a little bit more quirky. Uh, so it's a little bit more like that uh, would be the only little thing I would do with it uh, on there. But it's a nice uh, black and white conversion uh, on there. All nicely sharp as well. Uh, so well done. And the third one I had to show, since we were doing a, um, a one twenty twenty and there was a 2020 in the corner of the image. I don't know whether that's why you chose it, Andy, uh, but uh, I thought that would be uh, uh, worth uh, picking up as, a, uh, uh, as an image to talk about. Uh, quite like the graffiti on there. I'm not so sure about all the space over on this side. I don't know whether a, a tighter crop on there whether something more like that might might be a better shot, don't know, uh, on there. Um, I don't have a problem with that tightness in on it uh, like that. So a nice, nice one. Right, John. Uh, now, I know John's not on live uh, because he's um, hiding away in Beaumaris at the moment, um, he tells me. Um, but I wanted just to, to mention uh, this particular image, night shot. Um, the reason I pulled this one out was, I think it's the stars on there. Uh, I mean, I'm assuming they're stars rather than uh, dust that's catching the light on on it. Um, most of you will know the, the the one thing I would say about anything about night shots and light trails is try for that magic blue hour um, there, but then you wouldn't necessarily get the stars uh, on that. I get the feeling this is probably produced with the that little uh, Osmo um, clone type camera or a phone camera on here, although you've done quite well to get the, the light streaks uh, with it. I think it's a little bit underexposed, um, and that's partly due to the, the time of day on there. The problem is if you expose it more, you're going to get these even more blow, uh, blown out. So it's the time of day with it. Um, 
but I don't know whether it was the stars was the thing that you were aiming for with it. But that was my main comment uh, on that one. Now, Paul, I don't know whether Paul's watching. If you are watching this either on the replay uh, or watching it live, do let, let us know. Um, Paul, I, I think, if I remember right, there's one of the people I challenged this week. I was looking through the members of the Facebook group to see who hadn't been contributing, who hadn't been posting images, particularly people who joined and not posted anything. And I just picked on a few people at random and challenged them to post something this week. And Paul was one of those people. And he said it was done with a phone, a phone camera. And he said the most remarkable thing about the image was the blue sky um, that was there because he didn't often see it in, uh, in Yorkshire. Um, so anyway, um, I wanted to pick this out because there, there are a few things I would say about this. First of all, don't apologize for using um, an iPhone, Paul. Uh, there's a saying which is the best camera is the one that you've got with you. And I use an iPhone, if that's what I've got with me. And as I mentioned the other week, if I go out geocaching, I'm creating images using an iPhone. And I'm using it to help improve my composition techniques. And this is where the, the thing I want to talk about with this. Um, I know you said the blue sky was the important thing, but I think we can get the message of the blue sky without it being all the way up to the top. The actual subject to this for me is the chimney in there. And I like the fact that you've tilted it, but I think it could be a little bit more adventurous with that tilt. And I would be tempted to go with something a bit more like that on the, on the tilt, uh, so that there's less of the less of the blue sky and more of the tilt with it. So I would say something more like that. Now I would probably in if I was doing this with um, with my camera, I would aim to try and get the chimney across the diagonal, uh, more or less across the diagonal um, on there. So. I would be looking at trying to get almost that kind of angle with it, but that crop's not necessarily, eh, maybe it is. Uh, okay, we're we've not got decent resolution with it, but just trying to come in a little bit tighter, Paul, was, was what I would say uh, on that. Um, and doing that sort of thing can still give you an interesting thing. Now, it was made on an iPhone, so the other bit of advice I'd give, um, give you, the fact that I don't like part of my own crop there. I'm just adjusting that. Didn't like the chimney touching the frame. Don't like bits touching the frame. Um, is think about processing in on the iPhone. So an I, the camera on the iPhone is limited. Or well, whatever, whether it's a camera, or whether it's an Android phone or an iPhone, I can't remember. I think you said iPhone. And the problem is this area is underexposed. Now if you get something like Snapseed, you can bring out the detail in that even just using the iPhone to do it. So that would be my, my advice uh, on there. Um, we can still do the same thing in here. Let's bring the shadows up uh, on that and we've got some of that detail. Okay, resolution's awful because I've cropped right in but it was just one I wanted to show what could have been done with that and help point you in that direction, Paul, uh, with that. So next, right, I'm going to pick on Rick now um, with this. This was uh, a model shoot uh, in his studio. A uh, couple of things I just want to say about it. I love the expression. I think Rick shared the story that he was... Um, in conversation and something had been said and she said something and the, the, there was laughter. But the fact that he got the camera ready, he was ready for those moments. He got that natural smile, that natural reaction uh, of his subject rather than it being, uh, right, come on, smile, smile. I want a smile from you uh, that we, we sometimes end up with if we're not careful. It's about getting the natural reaction. Um, I, that hand up there um, does look a little bit odd to me, but 
I'm prepared to forgive that because of the smile and the expression. And uh, I like the use of the bounce boards just to give those, that little bit of grounding reflection that's on there. Um, losing a little bit of the detail of the lace into the background, which is a shame because it's, it's nice on there. Um, I don't know whether you'd even be able to bring that up in post um, on there, but certainly round here, this bit, it's almost invisible. Um, would clarity bring it up a little bit? Yeah, clarity would bring some of that up. So on that basis, I would probably think about using a localized adjustment brush, but with just clarity. Reset. Reset that. Let me go full screen. Uh, reset that and the clarity, clarity, clarity. Bring that right up on there. And then just try and bring and paint paint a little bit of it back and that's that's gone too far over especially as i've got no feathering on there uh, let's try that again and oh, i think the flow needs to come down and that's something we could just build up just to try and help that come through a little bit more i'll be careful on the legs um with it because that's kind of brought out a little bit too much on there but i i would try to do something like that just to help that become a bit more visible uh, on the on the image it just seems such a shame to lose it and just so that we can see it a little bit better uh, maybe the texture would help as well yeah texture's doing a little bit on there I've probably gone a little bit over the top around here, so just take that back a bit. Um, I'm hitting the, holding the Alt key, by the way, when I want it to go. You see it goes from plus to minus. That's just holding the Alt key on there. Uh, so, oh. so there we go. That's the, uh, that's the only thing on there. But just wanted to bring out that, the, the way that Rick's working with, with his subjects. Um, I know uh, from watching Rick work over the years how he builds that rapport with um, uh, with his clients and with uh, the models he's shooting to get those really natural uh, expressions that you can uh, you can see on the screen there. So moving on, uh, one from Peter. He said he'd been uh, down to see the um, Tour de France. Um, the only thing to say here, Peter, is just watch your crop. This. I think it's just cropped in just a little bit too tight on the, uh, the, the, the cyclist on the left. But it's a nice detail shot uh, and gives the flavour of the location. So well done for, for seeing the image and, uh, and capturing it on there. But just watch the crop a little bit, uh, particularly on that one side. Um, John was another one of the people I challenged uh, to, to post something. And I don't know the story behind the image. Uh, I actually don't even know if John's watching. I hope you are, uh, either live or on the replay. But the one thing I want to comment about here with these sort of scenics where there's a crowd. Um, I'm going to go full screen so you can see a little bit better. And it'll come out of adjustment mode. I am going to, ah, uh, we haven't got the resolution to zoom in, but never mind. Um, the thing, when you've got a crowd in the foreground like this, it's, even though the subject is the buildings, they are still part of the scene. And because they're cropped off, and the majority of them are cropped off around in awkward positions, it kind of makes the image that little bit unbalanced on there. So what I would like to see with something like this, even though that's the subject, is bring the camera down and bring the camera down just a fraction so that you can see the feet and see where those people are walking because we can't see any of their feet. And if you've just got that little bit of foreground in there, uh, then I think that would make it a much stronger shot. What I do like about this, though, is you've got your verticals um, 
uh, straight. And I know that tilt down, that very slight tilt down will probably, will cause the, um, converging verticals a little bit on there. But that's something that can be fixed in post-production uh, on there. And it's, oh, it's clundered uh, now um, where it is. So nice shot. Just think about those, those few little details, John, with that one. And this other one of John's, I've really got to show this because I think this is a fantastic image and I'm, I've got to show it full screen. And here we go. That is just lovely. Uh, a, uh, one of those sort of gossamer um, spider's webs with the, the water droplets on it. But just look in to, to these droplets uh, that we've got the ivy or whatever it is behind um, focused through there. Now, I can see the resolution on this isn't brilliant, and I think that's probably from, uh, from what Facebook's done to it. Um, I'm assuming this is nice and sharp on the, uh, the original image. I, re I really, really hope it is, John, uh, because it's such, um, such a, great, uh, a great image uh, on this. Um, so, have, uh, I just wanted to share it. So this is sort of thing to look out for folks, dew on cobwebs like that. And it works because of the shallow depth of field and the droplets focusing the light. It works because it's, it's using the technique of repetition in there where there's lots of these little droplets all over it. So big thumbs up from me um, to, to John on, uh, on that one. So moving on. Uh, right, out of full. Yeah, another one from uh, from John K. Barton this time, different John. And I've picked up on this one, uh, John, uh, because I, I just want to talk generally about something about images and a little bit about sharing images. And that is, uh, I know you share a lot in the group. I don't want to stop you from sharing um, at the level that you are doing. It's great that you are because seeing you share will encourage other people on there. But it reminded me of something that I was once told about photography. And that is when somebody looks at our portfolio, if we have got when uh, a portfolio of 20 uh, images and 19 of them are absolutely stunning brilliant images and there is one duff image uh, then people will judge you always on the strength of your weakest image and just think that through with I don't know what you use as your portfolio, John, or where you're sharing images other than uh, in, in my group. But think about what you share um, with that. And I, I would like, I, I've done this a couple of times with you, John, I'm afraid. Hey, you just end up being a good example here uh, for a, a point that hopefully will help lots of people. Is I want to give you a challenge. And the challenge is for you to think carefully about which images you share in the group. Now this one, it's a lovely composition and it's a lovely black and white conversion, but the whole thing is soft and out of focus. There's no detail left in there. Now I don't know whether that's because it's been downsized for Facebook or whether Facebook's done something to it, but an image like that that's out of focus, um, and badly out of focus, I'm, I'm afraid to say, is one that I wouldn't share on my portfolio because I've seen so much better work from you. And people will look at that and think, oh, John presents out of focused images. And that's not a good reflection on what you do and the images that you do share. So here's the challenge for you, John. Only share 
well, two types of images. What you believe to be your best work is the primary thing that you should be sharing now at your, the level that you've come to. So share those uh, and just share them as images. Don't need to say much about them. Just say uh, what it is, where it is, that sort of thing. Let the image speak for itself. And where you're letting the image speak for itself, just share your best work. Now, there will be another type of image that you will need to share. And what I'm saying to you does apply to everyone, but I, I, I particularly, I'm picking on you because you share more images than anybody else in the group. Um, that is, there will be other images that you'd need feedback on. Ones that you know haven't quite worked. Uh, so if it's not worked as you thought, then do share that as well. But specifically say on the image, I don't, something like, I'm not sure this has worked or this area is too dark, how can I fix it? So you're asking for help on the images. So you've got your portfolio ones where the images are talking, speaking for themselves, and you've got other images where you're saying, I know there is a problem with this. Can somebody help me fix it? Or what, did I, what do I need to learn from this? And I, the reason I'm pushing you this way is I want you to start analyzing your own images. Because that's where I want not just you, but everyone who's watching this live stream, everyone who's a member of the Facebook group, that's where I want to get you so that you can be objective about your own work. And that is hard because we remember everything about creating the images rather than just the image. So think of your images now, John, in those two categories, portfolio images and just choose your best. And if it's not your best, don't share it because it will reflect on you. But if there's an image or images that you think, I just need some feedback on this, then share it and ask the question, can I have some feedback? And preferably talk about what area of it that you think may or may not have worked. So I know you've said in, with some of the um, uh, conversions that you've done um, and some of the work, uh, I, I, I'm not sure this has quite worked and things like that. Or did I get my composition right on this? And ask the question so that people can respond. Um, it's not meant to be getting at you. It's just you're a really good example of what I want to try and get everyone to do is to present your best work and then the rest be ones to ask that question. Okay, I'll shut up and move on. Uh, this one, on the other hand, John, is, I think, a great portfolio image. It speaks for itself, nothing else needed. It's a good black and white conversion, and I really like it. And he's against the great background, um, and this is worthy of just letting it talk for itself. So well done. Thank you for sharing it. I really enjoyed looking at that one. Um, so spot on. And again, I just want to talk about this pair of images. And I, I'm sharing these because this is a really good example for other people uh, that might find, other people might find it helpful. Um, one of the things I've said many times on the live stream and on the Facebook group is about converging verticals. And we've talked about how black and white can enhance images. So what John did was actually he posted this image, but he then posted the original so that we can see the difference between the two. And we can see the work that he's done on it. Black and white conversion has worked well on there. And that change of the verticals, the crop to lose the car. Yes, we've still got the aerial in there. And to be honest with you, I just want to tell you one thing about this. I hadn't even spotted the aerial until just this moment. So it really wasn't detracting 
because I hadn't spotted it. But it could possibly be removed. Um, I think that would be a Photoshop remove rather than a Lightroom one, context, context aware. It would take, take a few minutes, but it could be done uh, on that. Um, uh, but it's a nice conversion. And what the reason I wanted to share this is to encourage other people to do something similar as well. If you've got an image where you have done post-production work on it, then why not share the finished image and the start image so that people can see the the way uh, the work that you've done on it so that we can we can comment about what you've actually done and i think that will help you as photographers it certainly helped me as someone trying to provide feedback because it enables me to say ah yes i can see what you're doing there or where you're going with it and understand the thought processes so i just wanted to share that um uh, so that as an example to other people how, of what John's done with that. Uh, yeah, Rick um, shared an image uh, from an outdoor shoot, harsh light, sunlight, unusual angle. Um, I normally tell people don't shoot up, uh, up people's noses. Uh, I like the framing on it. I think for me, Rick, I'd be tempted to come in a little bit tighter, uh, maybe, yeah, something a little bit more like that, maybe even just frame her completely that way. Is that a square, that crop? Let's just do it one-to-one. One one. Yeah, that's a true square. Yeah, I, I, I think a square crop on that one, for me, is, uh, is what works with it. But it's an unusual angle. I would probably have got her to tilt her head down a little bit so that we're not looking up her nose. I don't think looking up people's noses is particularly attractive, but uh, all credit for the unusual angle on there, uh, on that. Is that it for this set? Yes, it is. Right, okay. Uh, back over. I'm gonna have a look at, at the chat. Oh dear, I bet there's a lot in there. Minimize that. Mm. Uh, right, okay, let's have a look at the chat. Uh, Andy did put a very slight vignette on there. Good. Um, oh, and he never noticed, presumably, the 2020 on there, uh, on that. Um, yeah, Rick was saying about if the shoot was about the outfit, then yeah, he wouldn't have done the white on there. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Peter's explaining why his um, uh, images were uh, it was slightly cropped off. Um, yeah, Kev saying, yeah, it's a shame if it's soft, favourite of the evening. Um, Peter saying, is there a maximum number of images submitted to be submitted each week? I don't want to go down the route of a maximum number. Because whenever I set, if I was to set a maximum number, there'd always be a case for an extra one. Or if you're doing the, the behind the scenes and the other things like that, I don't want to set maximum numbers. If somebody's putting out too much um, and I'm not happy, I'll, I'll say to them. Um, so I'd rather you think about your images yourself, Peter, and decide is that an image that you want um, that's your, uh, amongst your best? And if it isn't, then maybe that's one not to share this week or that, that, uh, this, that day um, on it. And just be sensitive to uh, how many images are on there that you're not hogging it, um, I, I would say. Uh, just, just use a bit of common sense on there uh, with it. So, right. Um, Let's carry on and uh, carry on with how not to shoot wildlife. And remember, this is a light-hearted talk that, uh, huh, I say split over two live streams. It's actually going to be split over three. Last week, I looked at equip equipment. And this week is technique, but it's going to be technique part one. And I, I did it as a talk for the, the cruisers. So it's, it is designed to be light-hearted 
And it's about how not to do it because when I'm on the ships, there's always a lot of people who are much better at wildlife photography than I am. So let's carry on with, uh, with this. And so the techniques, it's all about understanding your subject. That's your start point with wildlife photography. And it's perhaps more than any other genre uh, that you need to put the time in to understand what it is that you're going to be photographing. Do your research. You need to know where you're going to find them. You need to know what attracts them to a location so that uh, you, you can go to the place and, or you can tempt them there. And I'll show you examples of that in a, a little while. Uh, and also what time of year that you need to photograph them. There's absolutely no point trying to photograph your rutting um, um, deer in the middle of February, in the middle of February or March. It's an autumn thing. So understand that. Um, also, when does the zoo open? You'd be surprised how often wildlife photography is done at a zoo. So my general message is read up, understand your subject, do your research, find out about them. Uh, so for example, a grouse, understand where you'd find that. Now I wouldn't know when to go and shoot a grouse or anything like that. A local wildlife photographer, uh, she invited me to join her on a shoot on the moors to uh, photograph grouse. She knew where to find them. She knew what time of day to go. She knew what time of year to look for them. And so that brown uh, end of summer uh, moorland with the grouse on there uh, came up with a great, uh, great image. Of course, there is an easier way to shoot um, um, a, a, a grouse. Yeah, I know it should be a picture of the whiskey bottle, but I didn't have one, so. There we go, my attempt at photographing the famous grouse. Understand your subject and how they behave. In Gibraltar, the apes, they are, they are thieves. They will take anything from anyone. And here we've got one, uh, as part of telling the story, it had stolen some, in, uh, some mints off one of, the, uh, uh, one of the tourists there and it was spending its time eating them. So perhaps it had a, a good, perhaps it had a key, a, 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 had a date lined up that evening and wanted to freshen its breath. But the other thing that with that is a little story to tell about making sure you know your subject and you can keep yourself safe. These apes are actually dangerous. They look nice and cuddly and, uh, and they're just cheeky, but they can be very vicious. When I was creating this image, I went in a little bit too close and this ape thought I was going to take the, uh, the mints off it. So it turned around, snarled at me and attacked, well, it didn't attack me, but it was very much, you go away. So I had to back off smartish because it thought I was after the mint. So you need to understand your subject. Understanding your subject and its behavior will allow you to get interesting shots. In South America, the black vulture, once it's rained, finds places to perch and it opens its wings. So you can get these wonderful shots of the, the, uh, the bird with its wings out because it's drying all its feathers and that's what it does. So go to, you can go to places where you know there's tall poles and you can get this shot with it showing all its, its wings uh, nice and easily, understanding about the, the subject that you're trying to photograph. And even in the UK, robins. Robins perch before they go in for their food. They find somewhere to sit and then they will swoop in onto the food and get out again. So basically they're checking the food out, making sure it's safe before they go in. So if you know that, you can put a garden fork near a food feeder and the robin will perch on the fork before going to the food. And that is why there are so many photos of robins sitting on forks in gardens because photographers know the behavior 
of the robin. They know that it will perch like that. So they put the fork there uh, to capture it and set the camera up to capture it that way. Understanding about rutting and understanding behavior of animals. And I have to mention this because people, photographers, have been seriously hurt doing wildlife photography. Photographers have been killed doing wildlife photography. I don't know whether they have with rutting deer, but even something like a, a deer in a park, at the wrong time of year, if you get between it and the thing it's going to charge, those antlers will hurt, they will kill, they will do serious injury. So be careful and keep out of the way. I just need to mention it. It's something I always mention when I'm doing talks on wildlife about be careful, folks. Okay, techniques. Next technique, early mornings. This is the time when most wildlife subjects are available. They're more active at sunrise. You'll find bird, more birds on your bird feeders around that time of day. Um, and you also get that golden light uh, to photograph uh, your, your subjects. So that's the ideal time to get out and do your wildlife photography. So use that time of day. But I don't do mornings, so I've got no photos at all to actually illustrate that point. I just don't do mornings. I'm not a wildlife photographer anyway. Um, exposure. Now this is one I need to mention because I've seen wildlife photographers and they good wildlife photographers who are doing much more of a hit and miss with their photography than they need to because they are not setting their exposure correctly. And the thing I would always say with wildlife photography, particularly when shooting birds, is to use manual exposure. Get your exposure set for your subject because your subject, particularly if it's birds, if you're using any form of automatic exposure, whether it's aperture priority, program mode, shutter priority, whatever, the camera is going to calculate an exposure at the time that you take the shot. So if you're tracking a bird that's moving from a bright sky over to uh, some cloudy bit of sky over to some dark trees, the camera is going to take into account the background when it calculates that exposure. And if it's on the bright sky, you will end up with a silhouette of the bird it will be underexposed. If it's, it might be right on the dappled sky, but then when you get onto the dark, the, the dark trees, as you pan through and follow it, you will get overexposed on the subject. The trees might be perfectly exposed, but the bird, if it's a light colored bird, might become overexposed. So it's a bit hit and miss. But if you can effectively get an exposure that's correct um, uh, for the subject and lock it in in manual mode. It doesn't matter where the bird flies. As you move through and track it, your exposure will be correct so long as it stays in the same light. It doesn't matter what the background is, what the brightness of the background. So let me just try and explain this with some images. So here we go, magnificent frigate bird on a bright sky. That's, believe it or not, is, is actually correctly exposed. They're quite dark, these, these birds. On a white sky, correctly exposed. On a mixed sky, correctly exposed. The same exposure across all of them because I had set the exposure on the full bird. Um, and you can do it even with a grey card, any substitute reading. So you can actually point your camera down at the grass, the green grass, or something like that. Take, a, take a shot, get your exposure based on there, lock it in in manual mode, and you know it's correctly exposed no matter what the background is for the bird that you're photographing. Having said all of that, there are times, just occasionally, like in this shot, 
where you don't want to expose for the bird, where it's worth getting the silhouette. And here, I think, is one of those times. Okay, focusing. Let's talk about focusing. Most wildlife photographers use AI servo or continuous focusing modes. That means that your camera, once it's got the lock on the, um, on the subject, it will follow it uh, for as long as you are half pressing the shutter release, if that's what, how you do focusing, or press the back button if you use back button focusing as I do, uh, then it will stay locked on there so long as that subject stays underneath the focus point that you have enabled. So it's worth enabling multiple focus points so it's easier for the camera to track. And all you have to do then is keep your subject underneath uh, those focus points while you have your shutter half pressed or the, the back button uh, pressed on there. And it works really well. Here's an example, one of my favorite wildlife images. Uh, I know the wildlife photographers probably will throw their arms up in disgust at this, um, but I was tracking this brown, pen, uh, brown pelican and it flew behind the trees. But AI Servo on my Canon still tracked it. So the focus stayed on the penguin behind... Penguin? Penguin? Pelican! The pelican behind the, the trees. It stayed on there, locked on there, and that became my subject. And this wonderful hazy look to it. And I really like this. But that is only possible because I was using AI Servo and I was tracking. If I tried to do that through the trees uh, on a single shot, and I'd focused, the camera would have locked onto the trees. 100% uh, would have done that. So think about working in that, that kind of mode. What about burst mode? Also known as continuous mode, if you, uh, depending on the camera that you're, you're working with. And this is very common with uh, wildlife photographers, uh, but there are pros and cons with it. So let's have a look at those pros and cons. One of the big pros with it is that if you've got a fast burst and you've got something in the middle of an action, hopefully one of those shots in that burst will be the killer image, the image that you want. The point where the dolphin is just at the top of its arc as it jumped out of the water. And the point when, I don't know, the bird capture, captures the fish and uh, uh, all that. So that's the big pro of doing it. But be aware of certain cons with using burst mode. And not all wildlife photographers use burst mode all of the time. Because it does generate so many images that you have to work through to check whether they are in um, um, uh, folk, uh, whether they are in bright in sharp focus on there. It also needs a fast memory card to clear your buffer. And you can, depending on your camera and your memory card, you can fill up that buffer and it can stop you from shooting as well. There's another con, which isn't on the slide, is it can make you lazy. It's, uh, it can make you um, think, oh, there's something happening. I'll just go, and I'll just take a whole thing and search through and find, a, find an image. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to use one shot. But I was using one shot with this one and I failed. So there are downsides. Let's talk about one shot though, single shot. Single shot may improve your ability to time your shots. And I know of some photographers who are moving over to it more and more for wildlife work because of the other advantages of it. You don't have quite so many um, images to search through. It helps improve your anticipation of what's happening as you're watching the scene. 
Uh, and you don't need a faster memory card. You're less likely to get the, uh, the buffer full or run out of, um, uh, of memory card. And this, the ones of, my, of the apes in Gibraltar, they were all done, uh, they weren't in burst mode. Okay, my subject's not moving quite as fast um, with that. But a lot of the, um, the bird ones I've done have been um, that way as well. Um, yeah, talking of those apes, that's the normal reaction I get with uh, to my wildlife photography. Uh, yeah, even e even the wildlife are doing face palm uh, when I do wildlife photography. Shutter speed. Depending on what you're photographing, you may need a high shutter speed to freeze the action. That image of the uh, Amazon dolphin, uh, the river dolphin was blurred because I hadn't got a fast enough shutter speed on there. And that may mean you have to put your ISO up higher than perhaps you would normally under those uh, lighting conditions. But it's better to have a slightly noisier image that's sharp than a blurred image with no noise on there. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, and a lot of wildlife photographers will work with a higher ISO than perhaps you might think uh, with it. Because you need that shutter speed. Hummingbird here, um, it's very small in the frame because it's one of the few times I've gone out from the ship without my, without my long lens. And just as I was coming back to the ship, this was in the Caribbean, I saw people hovering around the tree because there was hummingbirds uh, feeding there. Uh, but I was pleased I got this one. A um, little bit disappointed that it's so small in the frame, even after a little bit of a crop on there. But I managed to freeze the wings, which is why I was after. I got that classic po hummingbird pose with it because of that fast shutter speed. And I deliberately, as you can see, I'd opened the ISO to uh, 640 on there so I could get a shutter speed of 100, uh, one, 1,250th of a second at F8. Uh, and I, I went for F8. I could have gone wider with it, but I went for F8 because that's where the lens I got, the, the uh, 24105, that lens is a bit is a bit soft when it's wide open. So I try and avoid using it wide open if I can get away with it. And on this occasion, I got away with it. So what about the people who are using just compact cameras? I just want to mention um, this. If you're not comfortable with manual settings and things like that, consider using sports mode uh, on a compact camera. Because what does sports mode do? It favors fast shutter speed it will result in a wide aperture to thus give you a shallow depth of field, which most of the time is quite good for uh, wildlife photography because it blurs the background for you. It may push the ISO up a bit. Hey, that's what we're doing if we're doing it manually, so don't worry too much about it. It will disable the flash because we're, we're looking at sports here and it was never gonna reach the, uh, it's never gonna reach your subject in sports mode. Um, I'm probably never going to do it with the wildlife either, so go with that. And it may go into multi-shot, that continuous mode that I was talking about. So it may do that automatically as well in sports mode. So have a look and check with your own camera. But if you're not comfortable with all that setting of the, uh, doing the settings, think about using sports mode for wildlife. And talking of aperture, Often we do want a wide aperture uh, if the lens is going to be sharp at that point because it will give you that fast shutter speed. It, it will enable you to blur the background as well, thus isolating your subject. And here's one of my favorites. Um, with it. It's a chipmunk in Handia in uh, Fuerteventura in the uh, Canary Islands. And I spotted it looking at the, uh, the people in a cafe and if I'd have got that big depth of field with it, uh, I think the people would have ended up drawing the attention more. Whereas with this, the chipmunk is clearly looking on longingly at the scene um, beyond. So much prefer it that way on there. Okay, 
time to have a look at some of your wildlife images and um, let's see what you've been up to. So let me head back over. I'll put the display on here in a moment. So, yep, here we go. Not quite so many uh, posted this week, but a few I want to talk about. So, one from, uh, from Peter um, of uh, a, a bee, wasp? Not sure. I think it's a bee uh, on uh, on something. Um, again, I think it's sharp in the original, but it's quite tricky to tell at the uh, the Facebook resolution. Um, one of the things talking about this problem about what Facebook does and the fact that they are low quality uh, images. Uh, one of the things I, I'm I'm happy for people to do is I'm happy for people to email full resolution images uh, to me um, um, either um, through my, my standard my public email address of contact me at ians studiocouk um, or uh, to we transfer them and things like that if there are images you want feed, you know you particularly want feedback on we are working on a solution where hopefully you can upload them to my website and Andy Grady's been looking at it this week thank you Andy for all the work you've done on on there and we've found some limitations of the software that certain bits of WordPress are doing like um, Facebook does and strips out some of the exif information. Uh, we still haven't got a, a perfect solution on this, but that's another way. Uh, I think hopefully this week we'll be able to make a, um, a forum available which will help on that. Uh, in answer to a question you asked me, Andy, while I remember, is yeah, it's a downright swine trying to da download the images directly from S3. Um, it's possible, but it's a swine because it's it's not easy uh, with it, even with things like an S3 browser that I've got on there. I'll talk to you more during the week on that one, um, and we'll try and find a solution. But yeah, I'm assuming this is sharp. Can't quite tell, but nice capture. I would just like to see a bit more detail in this area, uh, that dark bit. So let's just just bring that out uh, I'll use the tone curve I think and bring the darks oh, actually no, more of the shadows up a little bit on there and maybe just have to bring the lights lights down slightly like that That's, there we go so something like that so we can just see that little bit more detail in the uh, uh, in the image there with that but other than that nice shot and this may be because I've got the lights on uh, but I think it possibly just needs a touch more saturation in there not a huge amount but just a little bit on there with that but nice crop with it Peter the square square crop works nicely on there and you've got your um, your B on the one third line so well done on that John um, I hope you're able to catch this on the replay. I'm pretty sure John can't um, uh, can't join us. He's often off the grid. Uh, a lot of his photos this week have been um, phone photos um, off the back of yeah, actually photographing the screen because he does have a habit of going off the grid with his wildlife photography. And um, yeah, he really would be that close to a um, uh, to a polar bear. I, having met John on a cruise and heard some of his stories, uh, I believe it was John who had um, an encounter with a polar bear sticking its head into the tent that he was stopping in one time. Um, needless to say, that's um, a little bit closer than I would like to be to a polar bear. Uh, 
there's um a, a, i was once told there is a very easy way um to tell whether you are too close to a polar bear if you can't hide it underneath your thumb like that by looking at it and put your your thumb over the over what you can see you can't hide it behind your thumb then it's too close <laughs> They are nasty pieces of work. Anyway, onto the image. Uh, this is a, um, a full image rather than a screen uh, image, I believe. Uh, with this, I'm in two minds about it. Um, I think, and it's difficult to tell with the resolution that we've got here, but I think it needs just a little bit more texture um, to it and perhaps just a little bit more clarity to help bring it out a bit maybe a little bit of dehaze and uh, if it has any it's only really small on there um contrast maybe a little i quite like the fact that it's all in the middle there uh, or the majority of it is so i would think something like that and uh I don't know whether anything can be done about that snow on its backside. It just annoys me on there. I know this is changing reality, and I don't know whether this is going to work because I haven't tried it. So I'm just going to see whether I can lose that snow. I bet I can't. Not from there, I can't. Oh dear. I think something like that, that little bit of work on it, just helps or stops the eye being drawn to the uh, the polar bear's backside, um, is my opinion on that one. Uh, but nice shot and um, uh, well done for getting so close, John. Yeah. Uh, this one's from Andy Wright. Um, I, I, I'm assuming Chester Zoo with this. Interestingly, the colours on here, um, they're very green. Now, I know that should be white. That doesn't look right at all. And we can see down here the tint's way too high on it. But I think we can probably do just a little bit down on there. Just take a little bit of that green out of it, I think, with that. I also think we need to just lighten this this area. So I'm going to take the highlights down behind, bring the shadows up just a little on there, bring the clarity up and the texture up on there. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take an adjustment brush. I'll reset everything. I'm going to take the exposure up. I'm going to have a Keep it quite low on the flow, because I want to be able to paint in just that little bit of brightness where it needs it. And you can see just enough on there just to help bring it out where it needs it on there. So before and after, that's before, that's after. So just a minor little bit to, to that just to help bring, bring that one out, Andy. Um, maybe I need to just bring the highlights down a bit more in the background. Oh, no. Not in the adjustment brush. Those highlights, just a fraction, maybe. Something like that. So that would be what I would do on there. But it's a nice capture. It's nicely framed, nice balance third line, a bit of framing over on this side. Um, it's obviously uh, the, the harsh light of day. So having it underneath the, in the shadow has helped, but it needed that little bit of extra work in post-production um, to make it work properly on there. I think this is just a fun, a fun shot uh, that Andy's shared. A penguin being interviewed. Uh, Actually, I don't think it's being interviewed. I think it's about to attack the, um, I was about to say the dead cat, which is actually the term that people use for the big fluffy thing on the microphone. And 
I've had when I've referred to them as that as the past, people have often gone uh, thought I'm I'm a bit weird, uh, but genuinely people do refer in the business do refer to it as a dead cat um, on there. But that, that's a, just a lovely capture uh, on there. It really just sort of tells the story uh, on it. And I particularly like that the other person in the shot has got an Iceland um, thing on there, uh, which is bizarre. I don't know why I like it because you'll never find a penguin up in Iceland. Wrong hemisphere on there. But just a lovely shot. Thank you for sharing, Andy. And another one. Now, again, the white balance on this has gone all very bluey um, with it. So I'm thinking, ooh, I don't know. That, I was hoping I could adjust it on there. I think that is way too blue. On it, so I'm just warming it slightly to something like that. Now, hmm, it still doesn't look quite right to me. On there, that's what would auto give me. Ouch! Don't like that one at all. Just bring. Oh, this is this is a tricky one, Andy. Um, Definitely wants a bit, a bit more texture in it and a bit more clarity. Too much. And we can see that we've started to bring out the scratches on the glass on there. I don't like that white balance at all. And I don't know what... Ah! Make it the magenta that way. Now warm it. I think somewhere like that might be it. Let's compare before, after, before, after. Yeah, I, I think it just needs that little tweak to the, uh, to the white balance on it, just to, uh, uh, to even it up a bit. Uh, Richard, um, I know he has meetings on a, uh, um, a Sunday night, so I know he won't be watching live, or I don't think he will be but had uh, shared a few images of Parliament of Owls. Uh, again, some lovely shots here. Um, it's a shame this one, there's obviously something in the foreground here causing that to be a little bit blurred. It's just a shame about that uh, on there, but a nice capture. Um, I bet I don't have, no, you see, I don't have the details to know what sort of length of lens that was, but I'm suspecting something like a 400 millimeter on there. Uh, with it. But this one's a good fun shot. Um, I'd be entitled to, uh, I, and I'd be tempted to give it the title of You Looking at Me? What are you looking at? You Looking at Me? Um, on there, uh, of, the, uh, of the owl looking in. So it's a nice composition. He's used the strong diagonal through the middle on there. There's a bit of framing with that. And again, the whole thing just works. Uh, with it and the unusual angle you see we've got even the birds on a diagonal that use of diagonals with it really makes it all, all work and we've got a nice shaped triangle in there framing the face again there's triangles everywhere on this so just sort of well done with that one Richard um, back to John and this is one of those where John shared the image off the um, but it's an iPhone shot of an image in Lightroom um, off, off the screen. So it's very difficult to um, check the quality on there. But what I do know is um, I think that will be, knowing John, that will be pin sharp on there. But what I really like about it is the backlighting on there. And you see that edge that's on it? That really works well uh, with this image. And the shallow depth of field, the throwing everything else out of focus, just makes the whole image work. Again, well done. If I was, I know it's difficult because this is a photograph of a photograph, but just to show the cropping on there, I would bring in the crop a little bit at the top, maybe a fraction on that side, somewhere like that. And that's the sort of crop I would go. Again, we've lost the clarity on there because of the, the resolution, unfortunately. 
of a phone image of a, a screenshot. The other John, John K. Barton again. Um, I like the concept on this, but it's an image that needs a lot of work. Let's first of all transform auto. Let's get those done. I'm going to um, scale it to get those feet in. Oh, I'm going to tr struggle with that. Um, how am I going to do it? Yeah, this is proving a, a tricky one uh, because I want to bring it in so I can get all the feet, which means I'm actually going to do something which you shouldn't here, which is a horizontal. I'm undoing a horizontal move there just so that with the Y offset, I can bring it up enough just to get that foot in. So now I can crop this and get the bird in there. And having done that, I can now get the exposure right um, with it. So let's go up basic and I'm just going to bring the exposure right up. Now this, I, by the looks of the quality on it, I think is an iPhone or a phone or maybe that um, uh, little gizmo of John's um, to get in that close with it, but um, it's it's got possibility. Now, yeah, the, the quality is not there to do much with it, which is a shame because it's a nice, it's a nice shot. It's just a shame the exposure was off with it and there's not a lot we can do to recover it, I'm afraid. And get rid of the cigarette butts though. Those just offend me. So move all that over there. So yeah, we've got um, we've got the bird in there. So if it had been correctly exposed, John. Now this is one of those where I suspect the exposure was wrong because it was in a, some form of automatic mode where the sky had dominated it and therefore it had underexposed everything else. Now this is where. I think you're probably hitting the limitations of the gear. I, I believe you've got a Nikon. If you've done this with a Nikon and use that trick of, I was saying about setting your exposure in advance, got the exposure right for, uh, for at least for this area, then when the seagull came in close uh, and you took the shot, uh, that would have been correctly exposed for it. Yes, the sky would have blown out a bit, but. I'd rather have had the bird exposed um, than let this um, way too noisy because we've had to do too much to get any detail out of there. So, is that the last one? I think it is. So let's go have a look in chat. Right, so what have we got in here? Um, yeah, Terry was asking for the uh, start and finish link cards for the uh, 120 20 challenge. Um, yeah, just to say about that, uh, you may have had some trouble downloading them during the week. I know Kev did. Um, Dropbox suspended all my public links for 24 hours because apparently I was using too much bandwidth or rather there was too much bandwidth being used with people downloading my stuff. So I don't know what it was which caused that to happen, um, but it was one of those things that um, they don't tell you what files are actually causing it. Uh, so not, not happy um, with it, um, with them for that. And in future, I'll be looking at storing uh, those sort of files up on S3 rather than Dropbox so that that sort of risk doesn't happen again on there. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, Q&A. Uh, I think that was my only question, the only question. Other comments in here? Um, uh, Andy's saying, yeah, the sun was strong and bright, harsh light. Um, 
Yeah, um, so those I think were the only questions I got in chat. Um, oh, we've got three of those. Oh yeah, any new images up in Facebook? So I'll snip over there, see if we've got anything new. <coughs> oh, comment from Paul Evans, who I'd been talking about earlier. Uh, right, let's have a look. Paul did catch the feedback live. Uh, yeah, um, he'd not edited the image at all. He now has Snapseed. Um, oh, right, I now know where I came across um, um, uh, Paul on one of, the, uh, one of the cruisers. And I'd recommended Snapseed to him then as well. So thank you for letting me know that you were watching um, uh, on there. And John, oh, and John got off Wi-Fi. So he's posted um, an, another image. So let's have a look at it. Ah, now, um, right, let me go over so you can all see what I'm looking at. This is John, one of John's images. He'd, he'd submitted it previously as a phone image uh, and it was the wrong orientation uh, and oversaturated. Um, so now we're able to see it. Um, I can't download it into, um, into Lightroom, but I do like the fact that the water's frozen on, on there. I would probably frame it a little bit more so it's not banging the center on that, John, if you're watching. Uh, but thank you very much for sharing that. And I think, I think that was at high ISO because I can see a bit of noise uh, in there. So we've got a bit of noise on the feathers on that, possibly cropped in a little bit uh, on there, but still nice capture. Nice to see the bird. Um, Whistler catcher? I don't know. He did say in a previous post. Uh, and I can't remember. Oh. Right. Uh, yeah. What else have we got in here? Right. Oh, this was um, one from Peter, which got posted just as we were going live. Some nice shadows. Now, now I'm looking at this again. I thought this was shadows against the wall. I'm now thinking this is shadows on the pavement, looking at it, and that it ought to be rotated through 90 degrees. I don't know. Oh, I'm not sure now with this one. So maybe you'll have to let me know, Peter, on that, whether it should be rotated or not uh, on there. Right, okay, anyway, back to uh, here. Let's finish off because I don't think I've got any more questions. Uh, no. Sorry, I'm having some trouble with the display here. I've managed to get it into full screen mode and I can't get out of it. That's it. I need to see it. Because I need to see the chat. Right, here we go. It's all very well. I can, I can easily put the chat up on the screen like that for you to see, but I can't, uh, I can't read it when it's on the screen there uh, with my, my setup here. I have to have it on the, the other screen. Um, ah, Peter said yes, and he did rotate it. It was the floor. All right, okay. Just so that I know on there. But right, yeah, let's, let's move on and wrap up. So just to say thank you everyone for letting me loose on your images again for uh, another week. Thank you for, uh, for that and for the conversations in the live chat. As ever, please subscribe, comment, like and share. Hey, we've got 15 people watching and 12 likes. We're getting there. Um, um, Yeah, oh yes, next time I'll do part three of this wildlife one, the remaining techniques. Hopefully I can get through all of them. I'm glad I did cut it short because I've been going for over an hour and a half, an hour 40 minutes, uh, dear. Um, so please continue to share your wildlife images in the group um, on there. Um, right, Terry has just asked a question. 
Do I regularly use any Lightroom plugins? The answer to which is yes. And I'll deal that with a question as a question next time uh, on there um, with it. And I've just realized you can't see the, uh, the PowerPoints that I can see. So do share that. And so until this time next week or during the week, uh, then uh, keep making great photos and I'll, uh, I'll talk to you all again next Sunday. Right, and bye for now. Right, this is the bit when I do the other ending for the cut down version when I eventually edit it. So here goes. Thanks for watching this cut down version of Ian Studio Live. You'll find the full version now over in my academy and highlights will be scattered throughout my YouTube channel. So please subscribe to those channels. Please have a look at the academy. Uh, details are on the screen behind me and links are down below on there. So until next time, keep making great photos and I'll see you next time. Bye for now. <music>